Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? I'm Praying Medic. Welcome to Supernatural Saturday. Boy, have I got a treat for you. But before we get into today's message, uh, I want to uh, thank you all, everyone who is praying for me and Denise, everyone who is supporting us financially, and everyone who has joined the live streams, everyone who is sharing their testimonies of healing. Uh, all of this could not be possible without you. So I'd like to just thank everyone who is um, supporting us and praying for us and encouraging us. I'm having a blast um, teaching people about healing and miracles, encouraging people to step out in faith and try it themselves. And in this message, I'm going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about healing and miracles that you didn't know who to ask. Uh, I'll just give you a short little uh, biography of myself. Um, I actually was uh, an atheist for most of my life. Uh, I did not believe in God. In fact, I hated Christians, and I used to taunt Christians uh, before I came, became a believer. Uh, I became a Christian at the age of 38. It was a dramatic overnight experience. One day I was literally taunting and mocking Christians, and the next day I was out uh, telling people about Jesus. Uh, it's pretty dramatic. <laughs> Road to Damascus. Uh, and it wasn't until eight years later, um, 2008, when I had a dream, my first dream in 25 years, where I met God in the dream. And he told me he was going to show me what was wrong with my patients. He wanted me to pray with them. And he said, when I prayed with them, they would be healed. He actually gave me a little bit of an anatomy test. He showed me some images. They looked like CAT scans or x-rays. And he asked me to tell him what I saw. He showed me three images. I correctly identified what I saw in the images. And then he said, uh, you pray for your patients and I'm going to heal them. Now, at that time, I was a cessationist. I did not believe in healing. I did not believe in miracles. Um, I had been attending kind of a, a mainline Protestant church that did not teach on healing or miracles, did not teach on the gifts of the Spirit. They basically taught cessationism. They taught that healing and miracles stopped uh, thousands of years ago, and we don't need that stuff, and God's not doing that stuff anymore. So I had a lot of unlearning to do. And... Uh, I basically, I, I read some books, watched some videos. John Wimber's book, Power Healing, was actually very influential. Helped me understand um, the issue. And you know what? Let me just share one thing that John Wimber said. So Wimber came out of the Jesus People movement in the 1960s. And he um, kind of developed his own stream of uh, his following, his belief system. And he was very, very interested in healing and miracles and relational ministry with the Holy Spirit. That was Wimber's big thing. He was very much into being led by the Holy Spirit. And in his early attempts to get people healed, he was having a lot of frustration because no one was getting healed. One day, while he was driving his car, God gave him a vision and he pulled the car over to the side of the road because he was having this vision. And he saw the sky turn into like a honeycomb. And he was watching this vision. And he saw this honeycomb in the sky. And it was dripping honey down. And he saw the honey landing on people below. Wimber said, Lord, what does this mean? And God said, this is my glory. It's my goodness. And it's my healing power. There is enough to go around for everyone, uh, but not everyone likes it. And he said, I don't want you to ever beg me again for healing. <laughs> All right. And from that experience, Wimber then began to pray for people for healing with much stronger faith. And that was instructive for me. Um, God has taught me a lot through dreams. Keys to healing keys to releasing miracles, keys to emotional healing, physical healing. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I learned 
You know, I, I started out like everybody else. I was just begging God to heal people and I didn't see anyone healed. And when I, when I finally got it through my thick head that I needed to stop begging God and start commanding people to be healed and releasing healing power, that's when everything changed. I prayed for probably around 500 people. Over the course of six or seven months, no one was healed. I was praying for people in the ambulance, grocery stores, um, hardware stores, everywhere I went, I was praying for people. No one was getting healed. I kept going though, because I'd come home and I would, I'd give up. I, I'm like, okay, I'm done. I tell Denise, you know, I, I'm out. I, I did my part. I prayed for everybody that I transported this whole week and no one was healed. I did my part. God's not healing people, so I'm done. And then I'd have a dream where I'd be in the ambulance and I'd be praying for someone and they were healed. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not getting out of this so quickly. So, you know, it, it took me um, time to learn how to release power and how to exercise authority. And those are the two main tools that God has given us for healing. There are others, and we'll talk about those, but those are the main ones. So uh, real quickly, I'm going to go through some of the New Testament scriptures that discuss the issues of power and authority and healing so that we're all sort of on the same page. All right. And you'll have to forgive me. I need my, my reading glasses for this. All right. Early in uh, the ministry of Jesus, he healed multitudes of people. Um, this account is taken from Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 38. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon Peter's house. But Simon's wife, uh, wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made a request of him concerning her. So he, Jesus, stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Okay, so this is our first example where Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. And what did Jesus do to get rid of that fever? He rebuked it. <laughs> I rebuke you in my name. Um, right, so what did he, she had a fever and he rebuked it and it left. Like he, like he had a personality, like it was alive, a living thing, like maybe a spirit of sickness. He rebuked it and it left. Jesus often rebuked um, evil spirits. Okay, so the, the inference here in this passage is that her fever was caused by a spirit and Jesus commanded it, he rebuked it, told it to leave. All right, that is an example of the exercise of authority. Authority is generally in the context of healing, uh, removing something that's not supposed to be there. And we'll talk more about this in, in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to kind of lay this foundational issue. The exercise of authority in the realm of healing is generally the removal of something that isn't supposed to be there. Okay? All right. We're going to move on. All right. Now we're going to pick up same passage, verse 40. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. All right. So, the Bible says that Jesus laid hands on everyone who was sick, everyone who was diseased, and everyone who was demon-oppressed. And he healed all of them. Not just the ones that the Father wasn't working out some plan in their life. Not just the ones that God wasn't teaching a lesson to through their sickness. Because a lot of us believe that we're sick and we're injured and we can't be healed because God's working out some plan in us. He's developing our character. Okay, Jesus healed everyone. He never turned down anyone who came to him for healing. Not one person wasn't healed. Sometimes he had to make two attempts. <laughs> On the one man who was blind, um, he, he rubbed some mud in his eye or something. And then the man said, and Jesus said, what do you see? The man says, I see people walking like trees. And Jesus was like, okay, let me try it again. 
<laughs> and the second time, he got the man's vision healed. But everyone who came to Jesus for healing was healed. That tells me it is the will of God for everyone to be healed. And we're going to talk about this more in just a minute. All right, now I'm going to continue. Jesus chose the 12 disciples, and he gave them these instructions. This is found in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Then he called the 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. All right. So let me unpack this. I am a kingdom teacher. That's what I do. Uh, I have a ministry. Denise and I have a nonprofit. We have an online church and you are one of our congregants. Uh, but I don't primarily teach from the perspective that the church is everything God is trying to do. Because Jesus only mentioned the church, the ecclesia, in the New Testament twice. Jesus preached the kingdom. When he commissioned his disciples, he told them to go out and preach the kingdom, to demonstrate the power of the kingdom. Jesus mentions the kingdom of God more than a hundred times in the New Testament. Okay, the kingdom of God is a very big deal to him and to me. And uh, I teach from a kingdom perspective, all right, because Jesus told his disciples, go out and preach the kingdom. All right, now, there are, uh, I'm not anti-church. I'm not bashing the church. I think that a lot of people have um, misprioritized the church in relation to God's kingdom. I'll just say that. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. All right. So in Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, Jesus gave his disciples power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. So those two things, power and authority, are given to disciples to do two things. Remove demons and cure diseases. Okay? They're not healing and miracles are not the same thing. Power and authority are not the same thing. They're two different things and they accomplish two different purposes. All right. Authority is used to cast out demons. When Jesus rebuked the spirit or rebuked the fever of Peter's mother-in-law, he was exercising authority. Let's look at the parallel passage to that verse in Matthew 10. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. This is Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8. Okay, so that's the commission Jesus gave to the 12. Wherever you go, preach the church, plant churches. Hey, plant a church over there. No, he didn't tell people to plant churches. He told them, preach the kingdom. Heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. That's what he told them to do. All right? Now, what did they do? They went out and did that. <laughs> they went out and they healed the sick. They cleansed the lepers. Jesus was doing it too. All right. That was his commission to them. In Luke chapter 10, okay, we find Jesus commissioning the 70. And here is verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he was himself about to go. We're going to pick up in verse 9. Whatever city, he told them, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Heal the sick that are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. All right. So again, he's telling his disciples, one, heal the sick, two, Tell people the kingdom of God has come. <laughs> All right. That's, in a nutshell, that's my ministry. My ministry is about, number one, helping people understand the reality of God's kingdom, and number two, helping them get healed. Whether it's physical or emotional, there's a lot of different ways people need to be healed spiritually. That's what I do. That is my ministry in a nutshell. I'm a kingdom teacher, and I teach on healing. 
after Jesus was raised from the dead, yeah, he was resurrected, all right, he told his followers they would receive power. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. All right. So the disciples, uh, his, his entire entourage of followers went, uh, he actually told them, do not leave, stay here in the city, wait for the promise of the Father, and you'll be baptized not many days from now. And they waited in the upper room. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and filled them all with the Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit Tongues of fire on their heads. They spoke in tongues, uh, other languages. Okay. That is the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is when we become filled with the Spirit and we have the power of God residing in us. When we are born again, when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, we receive the indwelling of God's Spirit inside of us. And that is the power we release for miracles. Okay? A lot of people ask if healing is a gift for only a few or a responsibility for all believers. Because so few people seem to be able to operate in healing and miracles. It's, and it, it, People sort of get this in their mind that if you do, if you operate in healing and miracles, you must have a gift because a lot of most people feel they don't have the gift. Uh, that is a lie. It's an absolute lie. I have taught thousands of people to operate in healing and miracles who never thought they could do it. Didn't have the gift. Look, I'm a former atheist. <laughs> and even after I got saved, I still didn't believe in healing and miracles. Okay. I don't have a gift. Uh, maybe I'm gifted as a teacher. <laughs> that's that's my gift. That's my calling to be a teacher. Uh, I'm not particularly gifted in healing or miracles. If I was, those 500 people that I prayed for when I first prayed for them, they would have been healed. All right. So this is one of the biggest myths that's out there in the church, that some people are gifted uh, to be healers. That's not true. Anyone and every one of us can operate in healing and miracles. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your history is. I don't care. You know, it doesn't matter. Healing and miracles are for everyone, all of us. Uh, Jesus didn't make exceptions. When he was commissioned in the 70, he didn't say, oh, hang on, not you two. <laughs> Everybody else, but not you guys. You don't have the gift. No, he gave the commission to everyone. And we're all, we all have the same Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Okay? The Holy Spirit that lives in you, lives in me, lives in my wife, and lives in other people. And that same Holy Spirit works miracles through everybody. Okay? Jesus gave us all the same authority. It's, an, it's not an issue of gifting. It's an issue of we all have authority. We all have the power of God living in us. The roadblock is not whether you're gifted. The roadblock is that six-inch prison between your ears that tells you you can't do this. Okay? You need to get rid of that thinking and believe that you can. And the reason I've been posting all these testimonies on my Telegram channel, most of these people who are sending me these testimonies have never seen anyone healed. They read the stories in Telegram. They thought, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. They tried it and they saw somebody healed. They saw themselves healed, right? It's working, right? And they've most of them have never done this before, okay? That's why I'm posting the, the testimonies. Because I want everyone to know we can all do this. This is not for gifted people. Now, there is a mention of the gift of healing. Actually, there's gift of healings and miracles. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians. Paul talks about it under the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. There's also the gift of faith, gift of word of knowledge, word of wisdom. All right. The gifts in context, as Paul is discussing them in 1 Corinthians, are primarily to be used among believers, not unbelievers. And the difference between the operation of the Holy Spirit in the gifts, tongues, right, miracles, healing, those gifts are primarily to be used among believers when we gather together as a church. 
The authority and power Jesus gave his disciples for healing and miracles is to be used with people who don't know God. Okay, there is a gift of healing. There is a gift of miracles. It's primarily to be used within the church. The authority and power for healing and miracles that Jesus gave his disciples is to be used for, with people who don't know God. That's the difference between those two. And in fact, if you're a believer and you have the Holy Spirit, you can operate in all the gifts. You can, you can operate in word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy. You can operate in healing and miracles. All the gifts, Paul said to the church in Corinth, earnestly desire the best gifts. Okay, Especially that you may prophesy. So we can all operate in the gifts. The operation of the gifts does require us to develop our abilities, our innate abilities that we possess. And a lot of people don't operate in word of knowledge, word of wisdom, miracles and healing because they're not hearing the Holy Spirit, they're not hearing the voice of God, they're not able to, they're, they're not seeing in the Spirit what God wants to show them. You could, I would imagine many times people are actually, God is sending them revelation about their illness, about the person they're praying for, and they're not picking it up. They're not hearing, they're not seeing it. The operation of the gifts of the Spirit is dependent on us learning to hear God's voice and see in the Spirit. And on that note, I'm going to remind you, yep, I wrote a book on seeing in the Spirit, and I wrote a book on hearing God's voice. Basic elementary um, teaching on how to learn to hear God's voice, how to see in the Spirit. That's how we pick up on words of knowledge, words of wisdom, whatever God is telling us to do, that's how you do it. You, you have to learn how to receive revelation from God. All right, moving along. Hang on. Uh, I actually wrote some notes here. <laughs> All right. The, now let's talk about power for miracles. The classic example of how power works is seen in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to begin this in verse 20. Suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her said, be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. All right. Now, we have a testimony uh, a couple days ago from a woman who had a flow of blood for 20 years. 20 years, she had severe abdominal pain and bleeding. And she literally one night decided, you know what, I'm just like that woman. I'm going to believe that if I touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I'm going to be healed. And she, she sort of did a prophetic act. She believed that she was grabbing onto Jesus' garment and she stood up and her pain was gone. And the bleeding was gone. It, it came back and then she prayed over herself again and it left. There, there's reasons why that happens. Uh, I don't know if I have time in, in, this, in this broadcast to talk about that. Maybe we'll talk about it in just a second. But I just, I want to keep going. All right. So, the woman was healed because she had faith. Jesus had the power of God inside of him. She reached out, grabbed his garment, and her faith drew the power out of him and healed her. Okay, The illustration here is that power is released by faith. We all have the power of God living in us. If, we're, if you're a Christian, if you've been born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. You are in a reservoir, container of God's power. You need to release it. You need to let it out. Just like Jesus did with this woman. In this instance, the woman's faith drew the power out of Jesus. Most of the time when I pray for people, and I'm going to release power, it's my faith that's going to heal them or work the miracle. But sometimes it's the faith of the other person. I just want to say this. I don't believe in the teaching 
that people are not healed because they lack faith. Um, I, I've heard that a lot uh, from various people. I, I think that that is generally not the case. I think that there are, there are certain mindsets that we can have that can prevent us from receiving healing. We're going to talk about those in just a minute. I don't think necessarily that it's always because we lack faith. Most of the time when I'm going to get somebody healed, I pray for them. They get healed. They're as shocked as I am. <laughs> they're, they're more shocked than I am because they're, they're not expecting it. Most people don't have big faith for the miraculous. When I, you know, I was in the ambulance for years praying for people. I'd pray for people to have sh their shoulders healed. And the little old lady was stunned when her shoulder got healed. She wasn't expecting it. She didn't have big faith. She, I just asked her if I could pray. And she, out of kindness or being polite, she's like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. You can pray for me. Probably won't be healed, but you can pray for me. And I've, and I've literally had people say, I probably won't be healed, but you can pray for me. And I prayed for them and they got healed anyway. So it's not, it's not generally a lack of faith on the person who is sick that prevents healing. Although in some cases that is the case, that's true. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. The illustration here is, we're the reservoir of power. Okay. When I want power to flow out of me into that person needs healing, I exercise faith. I believe they're going to be healed. I believe. That's it. It's what you believe. I trust, I have confidence that if I stretch out my hand toward that person, I'm, the power of God is going to be released. It's going to go into them and it's going to heal their shoulder or heal their carpal tunnel or whatever they've got. You know what? I'm going to do it right now. All right. So if you have carpal tunnel, if you have a sprained wrist, if you have uh, a shoulder that's messed up, frozen shoulder, uh, torn rotator cuff, if you have a sprained ankle, if you have a blown out knee, whatever it is that you, you had the, those soft tissue injuries, uh, I'm going to release power right now. And uh, some of you are going to be healed. <laughs> All right. I am believing in my mind that I'm releasing power and that power is going to heal you. I don't have to say anything. You don't have to say anything to release power. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. All right. I'm releasing the power of God. And I command ligaments and nerves, tendons, muscles, and bones to be healed. I command spirits of pain to get out. I command ligaments and nerves, muscles, cartilage, tendons, Carpal tunnels be open. Frozen shoulders, I command you to be healed right now. Adhesions, I command you to go. If you have frozen shoulders because you have adhesions, adhesive capsulitis, I command scar tissue to be removed. I command adhesions to be removed. I command shoulders to be mobile. Ligaments and nerves, tendons, muscles, and bones be healed. I speak a new meniscus into that person who is bone on bone in their knee. Brand new meniscus. I command soft tissue injuries to be healed. I command pain and inflammation to be healed. All right. So you saw how I did that. Again, uh, it's not when you're releasing power, it isn't necessary to say anything, but you can. Uh, I was commanding things. Okay, that's authority. Commanding spirits to leave authority okay with the meniscus what 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 happens with people who have bone on bone on their in their knee joint you have a pad between your leg bones it's called a meniscus and if you especially if you do a lot of running you'll shred that meniscus and it'll get uh, just obliterated and uh, normally you get a new knee knee replacement surgery or you get a new meniscus and I've seen I've seen dozens of people get a new meniscus uh, through prayer. <laughs> it's actually pretty darn easy. And what I do is I just release power. And the power goes into their body and it creates a new meniscus. <laughs> they feel heat. They feel tingling. 
And next thing you know, they're walking around going, hey, man, I don't know what happened, but my knee's great. Um, I prayed with a friend a few weeks ago. She had a blown out knee, severe pain. Prayed over, I just released power, put my hand about two inches from her knee, prayed over it, boom. Pain's gone, she, it hasn't returned. And she probably got a new meniscus. Okay, power works creative miracles. Creative miracles are generally the creation of something new. So if a person needs a new meniscus in their knee, you release power and that power goes into them and the power of the Holy Spirit goes in and just creates a new meniscus. If a person has um, structures missing in their ear, you would release power into their ear and the power would create new uh, eardrum, new hammer, incus, stapes, vestibule, whatever they need. The power is going to go in there and create new structures to replace the ones that are damaged. So, so the difference between authority and power, again, authority is removing something that doesn't need to be there, usually evil spirits. Power creates new things. That's the difference between power and authority. All right. And power is released by faith. I believe. I, I'm confident. I, I just know because I have seen so many people healed in the past. I know. I'm confident that when I release power and when I command things to be healed, it's going to happen. I have confidence. That's faith. And that releases power. You exercise authority by faith and you release power by faith. It's, 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 it's actually not that complicated. <laughs> I was talking in, uh, on the Telegram chat about healing blindness. And, and the same thing is true of healing deafness. I, I have seen people healed of vision problems. All right, I had this patient that I transported uh, from a nursing home to an ER. It was literally about a one block transfer. <laughs> the nursing home was at one end of the parking lot and the ER was at the other end of the parking lot. I had a very short amount of time to get her healed. She had a lot of problems. She had an aneurysm in her femoral artery that caused her leg to be numb. I got the, uh, her leg healed, numbness went away. And then I started, I was praying for her uh, wrist. She had uh, wrist surgery that was a failure and she lost the movement and sensation in her hand. So I prayed over that, the nerves, and got that healed <laughs> in the elevator on the way down to the ambulance. In the ambulance, I prayed for her numbness in her leg and we got that healed. And then we transported her to the ER. I went back to her, um, to the nursing home, and I hung out with her for about an hour and she's blind, all right? So I put my hand on her eyes, right here, near her eyes, and I released power, and I commanded her eyes to be healed. And I kept doing that, and kept doing it, and kept doing it, and kept doing it, and the longer I did it, the more her vision started to uh, uh, return. She started to see pools of light, little faint shadows and pools of light. She was completely blind in this eye that I was praying over. And she began seeing light. And then it per she progressively got better and better. As I continued praying, her vision was being restored. And that's pretty typical for how blindness is healed. Uh, the people that I know who have seen blindness healed, it's usually a progressive uh, healing. And there are some people who get their uh, vision restored suddenly. Can happen. Uh, hearing, same thing. Uh, sometimes, it depends on what the cause is. A lot of people are um, have deafness because of an, a spirit of deafness. You remove that spirit and usually the person will be, their heal, hearing will be restored immediately. If there's some kind of structural issue that requires power, new th uh, tissues to be formed, that might take a little bit longer, like blindness. It can be progressive. What's the, what's the deal with progressive healing? Um, when I was living up in Olympia, Washington, working on the ambulance, I met a man named Scott Bazell. And when I met Scott, he had Lou Gehrig's disease. He was paralyzed. He was on a ventilator. And he could only blink his eyes. Those are the only movements he had in his entire body. He could blink his eyes and he communicated with his wife, uh, George Ann, through blinking his eyes. 
she had a little chart with letters on it and he and she would point to letters and he would blink once for yes twice for no and she would point to letters and he would spell out the words that way blinking his eyes i i first transported him uh because he was on a ventilator and he had been admitted to the hospital for a fever and their fever resolved and we took him back to the nursing home and we transported him and uh, and, and I hung out there in his room for a while and I talked to his wife and got, got to know a little bit about him. And I ended up transporting him like six times, like in the next six months. I was transporting him quite a bit. And, and I really got to like, like and know George Ann and, and got to know Scott. And he was my first person that I started praying for who had a really serious disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. I mean, he's, he's been paralyzed for three years. He's been in tube feedings for three years. It's a terminal diagnosis. But I started praying over Scott. And um, every time I transported him, I would stay by his bed. After we um, finished the transport, I would stay at his bedside for about 10 minutes and I would release power into his body. And I kept doing that. I kept releasing power and commanding his body to be healed. Did it over the course of about a year. This was 2010, so I was pretty new to healing, actually. One day I came in to uh, Scott's room, uh, and Georgianne had this big smile on her face. She's like, Dave, you're not going to believe what Scott did this morning. And I'm like, what did Scott do this morning? She goes, he ate some pizza for breakfast and drank some coffee. <laughs> I was like, what? She said, I'm not kidding. And he's moving muscles in his arm. All right, this is the guy who's been paralyzed and on tube feedings now for four years by the time that happened. There was no way that this guy was ever going to be healed through anything but the power of God. And by me going into his room I, on that Christmas that year, I drove up there in an ice storm to the nursing home in Gig Harbor where he was at and spent a couple of hours by his bedside praying and just releasing power into him and commanding him to be healed. I spent a lot of time praying for Scott and I was I was shocked because it seemed to me like nothing was happening and then one day I came in and like Scott's eating and drinking the muscles in his throat were starting to were coming back he was getting healing in, the, in this muscles he could swallow and he had been on tube feedings like I said for four years he was progressively getting back muscle function through a lot of prayer now I told you that story to because it illustrates the idea of, of healing. Uh, I, I don't know exactly why it is, but it seems, and I've prayed for tens of thousands of people, so this is just me talking from experience. I've never done any clinical testing to quantify this, but it seems to me as though some conditions require more power. To be healed okay like Lou Gehrig's disease like multiple sclerosis those conditions for whatever reason uh, usually if someone has a neurodegenerative disease like multiple sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease progressive loss of muscle function and nerve function those conditions for whatever reason tend to require more power more prayer sessions more power to be released things like sprained wrists Carpal tunnel, uh, frozen shoulder, blown out knees, ankle sprains are relatively easy to heal one time. One prayer, one release of power, boom, they're healed, usually. Sometimes you have to command them to be healed a couple of times. But those type of generally soft tissue injuries, for whatever reason, don't require as much power. Okay, so I would use the analogy of like, if you if you turn on a light bulb in your house okay the average incandescent light bulb uses 60 watts of power if you have an led bulb it's probably five watts okay it's a low wattage watt consumption light bulb doesn't consume a lot of power doesn't require a lot of power to make it illuminate okay if you turn on a uh, your coffee maker okay your coffee makers are going to consume 600 watts of power you have to have 600 watts of power going in to power up a coffee maker and if you're going to run your table saw in your garage you're going to need 1800 watts of power right 
Some appliances and tools require more power to power them. And I think that some diseases require more power to heal them. Okay, I think, I suspect. This is, this is again, just from observation. Because I, I see kind of reliably, if you pray for somebody who's got multiple sclerosis, if they're going to get healed, it's going to take several months of praying for them to get healed. And again, I don't know why it is. I just know that it is. That's kind of a reliable pattern most of the time. Not all the time. We're going to talk about an exception here in just a minute. But usually, sprains, soft tissue injuries, um, things of that nature, carpal tunnel, uh, even, even uh, neuropathy. So I, I pray for a lot of people who have neuropathy and their feet, their feet are numb, they can't feel very well. Most cases of neuropathy are sort of in the middle. Uh, you're not always going to get healed, neuropathy healed on one prayer session, but you should see significant change in two or three sessions of prayer. The neuropathy in your feet doesn't seem to be as bad as like multiple sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease. It doesn't seem to require as much power. I'm going to talk about authority for a second. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, even in all of Israel. Verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed at that same hour. The point of this uh, story that I wanted to bring up is the centurion had great faith. When the disciples were trying to get this boy healed in Matthew chapter 17, he, he was demon possessed. They couldn't, he, couldn't heal him, couldn't cure him. So they brought the boy to Jesus and Jesus rebuked his disciples because they didn't have faith, because of their unbelief. And they asked him after when he cast, Jesus cast the demon out and the disciples came to him and said, Lord, why could you cast it out? But we couldn't. And he said, because of your unbelief because you had you didn't have the faith necessary in order to release power and exercise authority you have to have faith and it is great faith not small faith that is the most effective faith is the valve that opens up and lets the power flow out of us and we exercise authority because we have because we have faith okay if we have unbelief if we have doubt and if we have fear, they act as restrictions to the flow of power. We're not tra transmitting the power through a very big line. We're transmitting it through a very small line. Smaller lines carry less electricity, less power. Unbelief and fear and doubt are the things that cause us to be unable to release more power. And I think that's why Sometimes, like a person like me, I might pray over somebody who has carpal tunnel in their wrist and they'll be healed with one, uh, one attempt. Somebody else might go to that same person and might require them to do it three or four times. I think it's because I'm probably, maybe I'm releasing more power because my faith, my confidence is a little bit higher. And that just creates a larger flow of power into that person. The person who has doubt and unbelief they got to keep going and keep going because they're trans they're transmitting less power. But when when I pray for people to be healed, a lot of times they feel tingling, they feel heat, right? That tells me that there's power, energy going into them. <laughs> they can feel it, right? Their nervous system picks up the power and they feel heat, they feel tingling. That's evidence that power is being released. The question is how much power? I don't know. I can't tell you, like, I'm releasing 10 watts of power every time I pray for someone. I, I don't know how to, how to quantify that. But I think the principle is true. I think some of us release more power than others. And I think that 
that's why we we see we have different uh, abilities um, to release power. And it's not a, it's not really an ability. We all have the same capacity. We all have the same uh, ability to release power. Some of us are realizing it. Some of us are living up to a higher potential, and others are are not because they have fear and unbelief and doubt. All right. I have a friend here who lives in Phoenix. His name is Tom Schermitzler. Tom uh, pastors a church called God's Living Room. If I'm not mistaken, Tom was a disciple of John Wimber. Uh, I know he was heavily influenced by John Wimber. Tom has operated in miracles and healing for a long time. I've learned quite a bit from him. Tom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And he had a very rapid progression of MS. He was perfectly healthy one day. He started feeling numbness in his feet, like he was walking on cotton balls. He lost his sensitivity in his feet, and within uh, a week or two, he was, it was pretty severe. He ended up in a wheelchair. He was too weak to walk. Ended up in a wheelchair. And I mean, this, is right about, this is right after he got married, too. He had just gotten married, and he gets hit with MS. And he's a pretty young guy, actually, when it happened. So he's devastated. You know, he's, he's full of faith. He's seeing people healed, miracles, and then he gets MS. And he's so weak, he's in a wheelchair to, to get around. All right, fast forward some time later. I don't know how long uh, he was diagnosed before he was healed. But he was, he was in Phoenix at a church in a prayer meeting with a bunch of guys, it's a men's prayer group. And they're in this church and they're kind of just sort of like went their own way to pray in their own little corners and do their own little thing. <laughs> One of the guys sees something over Tom. Tom's sitting in his wheelchair. And the guy's like, hey, Tom, I see something over you. And all of a sudden, boom, like that. Tom feels something like warm honey pouring over his body. And it's just dripping down over him. He gets up out of the wheelchair, bolts out the front door, and goes running up and down the streets. Um, he was healed. Miraculously, instantly healed. A sovereign miracle. No one was praying for him. God just sovereignly dumped a bucket of power over Tom, and he got healed and got up out of that chair. And it never returned. That was years ago. He, he's been healed ever since then. Okay. I would pray for Tom with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis for probably, you know, five or six months before he'd be healed. God drops a bomb on him and he gets healed immediately. I don't know why it is that we all don't receive that miracle bomb drop from God that just clears up all of our issues. I, I really don't know why that is. I know that it happens. I don't know why it doesn't happen more often. I have some suspicions. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But sometimes God will release a just enough power to heal someone completely, instantly, miraculously. I receive a lot of emails from people, prayer requests, where someone will recite all the good things that their friend, their neighbor, their relative has done. All the great church activities, how they, you know, make all this sacrifice and donate money and spend all their time doing great things. And they're reciting this um, resume as if, and then sometimes they'll literally say, this person really deserves to be healed. As if our, our actions, our behavior can earn us God's favor. Well, um, I, I have some news for people who think that. God is not a respecter of men. God's not impressed by our spiritual resumes. It's, it's good to do uh, good works, but it doesn't earn you healing in God's eyes. Healing and miracles are acts of sovereign grace on God's part toward us. And we are all able to receive the same degree of healing regardless of what we've done in, in, to, to merit any favor. Your religion, your spirituality, your resume doesn't qualify you for healing. It also doesn't disqualify you for healing. I don't care how sinful you've been. I don't care how many affairs you've had. I don't care how much drugs you've done. I don't care whose lives you've wrecked in the past. It doesn't matter. Uh, I have seen some of the worst, most abusive, evil people you've ever met healed miraculously. 
God doesn't really care about your past when it comes to healing. Healing is available to everyone on an equal basis. You don't have to recite somebody's resume to show to me that they deserve to be healed. Um, healing isn't deserved. Uh, healing is a gift, and you either receive it or you don't. Because healing is an act of God's grace, it's, it's available to everyone. It's even available to your pets. So, yes, your pets can be healed. Um, healing for pets is done the same as it is for humans. You release power, you exercise authority. If there's evil spirits, you get rid of them. Same for pets as it is for humans. It's no difference. And um, healing is just as effective over distances as it is in person in most cases. I think there is a couple of situations, they're rare, but there are a couple of situations where it'd be better to have the person with you. But uh, generally speaking, healing is very effective over distances. When Jesus healed the centurion's servant, the centurion was like, no, 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 don't come to my house. You don't have to be there in person. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And he was. And I pray for people all over the world. And I see a lot of people healed uh, through distance. So it's not an issue. No, you don't have to come to my house to be healed. <laughs> I hear people talk a lot about authority. And there's a lot of really bad teaching uh, about authority, what it is, how it's exercised. People sort of hear the word authority and they're taught, you have to claim your authority. Well, claiming your authority doesn't do anything. Um, I hear people say they're taking their authority. Well, you don't have to take your authority. <laughs> right. If you think of just think of authority as a king, okay, a king doesn't run around telling his subjects in his kingdom, I claim authority or I'm taking authority. A king issues orders. A king makes decrees. A king writes laws, all right? All right. A, why does a king do all those things? Because a king has authority. They know they have authority. They know they're the king. They sit on the throne every day and they're like, hey, I'm the king. I get to do stuff. <laughs> hey, you, go bring me my lunch. Hey, you, wash my clothes. You over there, go cut down those trees and let me know when they're cut down. Kings exercise authority. And Jesus is the king of kings. And he has given us authority. We're his representatives. Uh, the Apostle Paul said we are ambassadors for Christ. Okay, we're, we're representatives. We represent the King of Kings. We exercise authority on his behalf. When um, a lot of people pray in Jesus' name and they think that it's um, a little jingle that's going to magically make people be, you know, be healed. In Jesus' name really means I'm doing this under the authority given to me by Jesus. It's really in Jesus' authority. Okay, I'm doing that. I'm going to get you healed. I'm going to release power. I'm exercising authority because Jesus gave me authority. Because the power of God lives in me. All right. So in Jesus' name is, is not little magic words that you can throw out there that are going to make the demons run away. Uh, the demons see you, and if they recognize that you are a person of authority, they're going to take off. If they don't respect you and don't believe that you know who your identity is and your authority, they're not going to respect. They're going to stick around and torment you or your friends until you grow into spiritual maturity. And, uh, and they'll recognize that because we all have different evil spirits see us all differently. And your spiritual growth actually has a fingerprint, a footprint in the spiritual kingdom. Some people are spiritual giants. Other people are spiritual midgets. And demons look at you and they recognize your spiritual state. And they either obey you or don't obey you based on your spiritual maturity and the level of authority that you're operating in. The greater your faith, the more um, effect the exercise of authority is going to have in the physical world and in the spiritual world. When you command demons to leave, they're either going to leave or they're going to stay based on how they perceive you. All right. Now, when Jesus came to the man from Gadara who had the demons called Legion, he told them to leave and they didn't. <laughs> All right. This is Jesus, the son of God, and he's commanding the demons to leave this guy. And they said, eh, screw you. We're not leaving. We're sticking around. So Jesus then asked their name. What is your name? 
And they said, Legion, for we are many. All right. Jesus wanted to interrogate the demons, right? But they didn't leave immediately. Uh, some demons are more powerful than others, and some demons will stick around a bit longer. Some demons are um, very, relatively easy to get rid of. Spirits of pain are very easy to get rid of, actually. Uh, that's the good thing. If you get jumped by a spirit of pain and you have, you know, uh, fibromyalgia, for example, <laughs> spirits of pain are actually relatively easy to get rid of. They don't put up a lot of fight. When, when someone who knows how to exercise authority shows up, and commands those spirits of pain to leave, generally speaking, those spirits of pain are going to go. They may come back, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, spirits of pain are relatively easy to get rid of. Spirits of divination, uh, a little bit harder. They have more of a reason, more territorial issues, and they, they're a little more difficult to get rid of. And there are other types of spirits. S some, some evil spirits are quite difficult to get rid of. I'm not going to go into a long discourse on that, but different types of spirits uh, respond differently to our authority. Just wanted to throw that out there as, as a caveat. We receive healing, we receive miracles, sometimes according to our faith. Right? So, with the centurion... What did Jesus tell the centurion? He said, As you have believed, so be it unto you. All right. So the centurion got what he asked for. He wanted his servant healed. And Jesus said, As you have believed, so be it unto you. I'm, you're going to receive what you have believed for. And I'm not suggesting that if you just have enough faith, you're going to have a Lamborghini sitting in your driveway tomorrow. <laughs> that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the realm of healing and miracles. You can receive up to that which you can believe for. Right? I have people who send me prayer requests. And they have family members who are suffering from serious diseases. And all they ask is that um, I pray that the person would be able to bear the pain, that they would be made comfortable. They don't ask for the person to be healed. They don't believe the person can be healed. So they ask, well, you know, just make their symptoms easy to bear or make them comfortable, I'm not expecting them to be healed or anything. That's a problem. If you will only ask for uh, small things, you're going to receive small things from God generally speaking. If you're bold, and if you're willing to ask for big things, you have at least the possibility of receiving big things. It doesn't mean you're always going to receive them. But if you don't ask, you're not going to receive, James said, you have not because you ask not. Okay. I find it unfortunate when people have so little faith, they don't believe the person can be healed. They just, you know, oh, well, you know, let them be comfortable. Uh, that's that's not really what God's into. God is into the miraculous. He wants people to be healed. And he wants us to believe that they can be healed. <laughs> that's, that's kind of how the deal works. So, again, the lesson here is, um, as you have believed, so be it unto you. So be careful what you believe. Because what you believe in many cases is going to determine whether you're healed or not, or the other person's healed. All right, basic exercise of authority. As I um, use in that demonstration, basic exercise of authority is commanding something to leave that shouldn't be there, commanding evil spirits, get out, <laughs> commanding bones to be healed. So you can release power to heal bones, create new bone tissue, create new ligaments, new tendons, new muscles, new cartilage, new meniscus, whatever the person needs, um, you can create new things releasing power because power works miracles. With authority, you can command things to happen. 
I often do both. I usually release power and I command. So I command new nerves. I command new tendons, new ligaments, new cartilage, new bone, right? I'm commanding those things to be made new. Now, uh, that's, that's kind of basic exercise of authority. Uh, let me give you an example. Years ago, I prayed for a friend who came to visit me. She had Lyme's disease for many years. She had pretty frequent outbreaks and she was miserable. When she got an outbreak, it was horrible. Uh, she just complained about it all the time. Came over to my house and she said, and we were talking and hanging out. She just gets me aside and goes, hey, Dave, can you pray for me to be healed of Lyme's? I'm like, yeah, I'll pray for you. So uh, I just put my hand on her shoulder and I closed my eyes. And what I saw in a little, like a little microscope ring in my mind, I saw all kinds of little black dots. Something like uh, what you might expect to see bacteria on a slide in biology class, you know, little bacteria all over the place. So I commanded those um, things to die. I didn't know what they were. To me, they look like bacteria. I just commanded those things to die. If God shows you something and you're not sure what it is, just say that thing, <laughs> I want that thing gone. I don't know what it is. I want that thing gone. You don't have to be a biologist. You don't have to be a doctor to get people healed. If God shows you something, you don't know what it is, just say that thing, get away, get lost. So I was commanding these little black spots to go away. I, I actually spoke death to them. I said, I speak death to these little black things, command you to die, uh, command you to be eradicated. I command you to die, be gone, be eradicated, get out of here. And I just kept on doing that for about 10 minutes. I kept my eyes closed and I could see these black things disappearing. They were disappearing little by little. And after about 10 minutes, they were gone. It was like, I saw this white ring and there was nothing in there. And I told my friend, okay, well, I think you're healed because I don't see any more of those black things. I called her up six months later. She had not had any, any more outbreaks. I called her up a year later, no outbreaks. She was healed with um, living organisms like bacterias and viruses, COVID, it's a virus, it's a living thing. You can actually just command them to die if you want to. You can command the virus, I do that all the time. Command the virus to die, command the bacterial infection to die. You can command it to leave. If it's a tumor, uh, you can command it to get out, cast it into the sea, right? What did Jesus say? If you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, be gone, it'll be cast into the sea. You can cast tumors into the sea. Tell them to be gone. Authority is the removal of things that are not supposed to be there. Fevers, inf bacterial infections, viral infections, tumors, things that are not supposed to be there you want gone, you exercise authority and command them to leave. Okay, that's the basic exercise of authority. That's how authority differs from power. Power you're releasing the power of God and you're creating something new with authority. You're commanding, generally commanding things to leave, but you can also command, you know, bones to be healed and things of that nature. Moving along, God has given us a lot of tools for healing and miracles. He has given us a lot of tools. I have a kind of a growing list of things that God is showing me that are tools we can use for healing and miracles. Like a checklist, sort of things that you don't think of, things that you haven't tried. Uh, and there are a, there's a tool belt, <laughs> a lot of tools on there. And I'm learning about more all the time. All right. Um, in the book on power and authority that is coming out that I'm going to write here, I'm working on writing it, I will go through all of those um, tools, all of those issues and list them out and explain how they work. I don't have time in this broadcast um, to explain them all. I'll, sh I'll tell you about some of them, the most common ones that I think are the most helpful. Okay, deal? All right, so I often get emails and questions from people. I prayed, I released power, I exercised authority and nothing's changing. I'm still stuck. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Okay, this is where we need to look at different tools. Um, sometimes power, just a simple release of power works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes exercising authority works, sometimes it doesn't. 
here's, here's an example. Um, unforgiveness and emotional issues can block healing. All right, I had neck pain for several years. I went to a healing conference in Spokane and I went there expecting to get healed of neck pain. After one of the speakers was done speaking, I went up to the platform. There was a heal team there. They were praying for people to be healed. Uh, she said, what do, you need, what do you need to be healed of? I said, I got neck pain. She said, okay, I'm going to pray for you. She closes her eyes and she says, are you harboring anger at unforgiveness toward anyone? <laughs> was, and she said, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to show you who you're angry at. In my mind, I saw a picture of Denise's boss. Now, she was working at a company at the time, and the boss was very manip manipulative and controlling. And I was pretty angry at him, and I had some unforgiveness. So she said, all right, well, I'm going to ask you to release the anger and forgive him. And I was like, okay, Lord, I release the anger and I forgive him. And boom, like that, my neck pain was gone. Okay. So what was the key? The key is that I was holding anger towards somebody and um, it was a spirit of pain. Okay, I didn't have an actual, she didn't pray. She didn't release power. She didn't exercise authority. She just said, you know, I want you to release the anger and forgive this person. And I did. And boom, like that, the pain left. That tell, told me it was a spirit of pain. And as soon as I released the anger, and forgave the person I was healed now so let's talk about that how does that work exactly all right in Ephesians 4 verses 26 and 27 Paul wrote in your anger do not sin do not let the Sun go down while you are still angry do not give the devil a foothold all right so what is anger it's a negative emotion what is a foothold it's a way that the enemy can torment you. And with most of the people that I communicate with who have received prayer and they're still not healed, especially if it's pain, I ask them to go through emotional healing. Some of them are glad to do it. A lot of them aren't because they don't think they need it or they're too, you know, too busy or whatever. Um, I, I can't. I can't tell you how many testimonies I've had of people who've had physical symptoms of pain, uh, went through the emotional healing process, and boom, their pain left. So Denise and I got to uh, pray with a woman a few years ago. We were up in Olympia. Um, I was teaching at a, at a conference. I met this woman, and she had been in four car accidents over the span of about three years. She had horrendous neck and back pain all the time. X-rays were negative. But she was convinced that the pain was due to the car accidents. We get together with her and I find out and I just, I'm walking her through this emotional healing process. And I said, tell me about uh, the worst, the most painful memory of your life. And she told me about the time she well, basically she had two ex-husbands who were both very abusive. They used to punch her. I walked her through the process of recalling these um, events. She identified that she had a lot of anger <laughs> toward both of her ex-husbands. And I had her give the anger to Jesus and Jesus healed the wound in her soul. We did that for one husband. Then we did that for her second husband. And then we did that for her father because her father was also very abusive. And she held a lot of anger toward him. She released the anger. And when she was done, she stood up and all of her back pain was gone. And we communicated with her months later and her back pain never returned. Okay. She had physical symptoms of pain, but it wasn't physiological. It was spiritual. She had evil spirits. She had spirits of pain attached to her. And they were there because hanging on to the anger opened the door for these spirits to attach to her. And once she let go of the anger that healed the wound in her soul, it had no place of attachment for the evil spirits of pain, and they, they just left. I seldom do deliverance on people anymore because I do emotional healing first. And if you do the emotional healing, heal people of the trauma from their past, deal with the negative emotions, most of the time the symptoms will go on their own. Don't have to cast the demons out. None of that nonsense. <laughs> 
<laughs> I remember years ago, I was, I was at a church and I was teaching this, uh, teaching on emotional healing. And I was with this woman and we were going through her history and she's telling me about this, you know, thing that just really caused her a lot of sadness and grief. And I said, okay, well, you know, repeat after me, Jesus, I ask you to take this emotion. I ask you to heal the wound in my soul. She said that. And as soon as she said that, she goes, oh my gosh, I felt something lift off of me, right? Well, she got delivered of, a, of an evil spirit. Um, she felt lighter and she felt that evil spirit lift off of her. Uh, that's actually pretty common. Uh, when, when I do emotional healing ministry, a lot of people can actually feel the evil presence leave them. Uh, so for, for people who have tried power, tried authority, and they're still struggling, especially if you have things like fibromyalgia, um, fibromyalgia is not a diagnosis. It's not a physiological problem. The reason they say that you have fibromyalgia is because they've done all these tests, they haven't found anything. And fibromyalgia is kind of like the junk drawer diagnosis for we don't know what's wrong with you. You have pain, but we don't know what causes it. Well, uh, everyone I've ever prayed for who had fibromyalgia <laughs> um, felt significantly better reduced pain after going through emotional healing. Most of the chronic pain syndromes like that are actually rooted in emotional trauma. And emotional healing is very effective on treating those. Okay, so that's one tool that we can add to our toolbox for when people are not healed. Say, well, did you go through emotional healing? Uh, I have sent out links to dozens of people this week uh, for the emotional healing thing. The, the, the book, you can, you can get the book. But if you, if you don't want to buy the book, just email me and I'll send you a link to the download for free. I sent this link out to a lot of people. Um, you know, a fair number of people, they're like, eh, you know, whatever. I don't think I need it. Too busy. You know, that's not going to help me. That's not the issue. Well, okay, fine. Uh, you asked me what my opinion was. And I think if you go through emotional healing, you'll feel a lot better. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, they, a lot, there's people that just won't go through it because they don't think they need to. And, and that's fine. Uh, you know, be it with you according to your faith. <laughs> Agreements and vows. All right. Um, there's kind of an unusual um, thing. If you're, if you're in a group of people who are very into healing and that sort of thing, you'll hear about uh, making agreements and vows, making vows. Vows can be very powerful. Inner vows that you say to yourself. Um, coming into agreement with things that the enemy has, wants you to agree with. There is power in agreement. And there is power in internal vows that you make. I can't tell you how many people I have ministered to who made inner vows when they were young because they saw things they didn't want to see, experienced things they didn't want to experience, had relationship issues, and said, I'm never going to get married again. I'm never going to trust this thing. I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to do that. I'm too stupid. I'm never going to read in public. There was a testimony of a guy who was a very gifted public speaker, but for years he couldn't speak publicly because when he was in school, um, he had a teacher that didn't like him. And the teacher assigned uh, all the members of the class to do a reading in front of the class. And the teacher assigned the readings and gave this guy a really, really difficult, complex thing to read and he couldn't pronounce a lot of the words and he got up in front of the class and he was stumbling over the words and he was very nervous and fearful and became more and more angry and frustrated because he couldn't s pronounce these words and the, the teacher thought it was really funny but this guy made a vow he said I will never speak again in public and from that time on he could not get up in front of a microphone and speak without becoming frightful and ter terrified. Uh, one day he went through emotional healing. <laughs> the person who was speaking to him said, you know, I have a feeling like you made a vow some time ago where you said like, you're never going to speak publicly again. And the guy was like, and the memory came back to him. Boom. Oh man, I said that when I was, and that's why I can't talk in public. He renounced the vow he made. He came out of agreement with that. And ever since then, he's been a very eloquent public speaker. But 
I mean, in a sense, he kind of cursed himself by coming into agreement with that lie. So one of the things that holds people back in a lot of different areas in their life is agreements and vows, inner vows that we've made to ourselves. Because the enemy will then go to God and say, oh, you know what? Remember when he said this? He said he's never going to do this. So I'm going to oppress him and oppose him. And I'm not going to let that thing go because he said it. And the enemy is a legalist. And they will use your words against you. In fact, Denise, my beautiful wife, she had a uh, herniated disc in her back uh, years ago. Uh, we got the MRI. You could see the herniation. Uh, she had discs bulging above and below the herniated disc. She was in severe back pain. Um, she could hardly walk. Uh, we'd go to the grocery store. She'd try to accompany me. She would put all of her weight on the grocery cart. She was in so much pain. I prayed over her and prayed over her and prayed over her and prayed over her. Uh, no change. One day, she listened to it. Uh, and at some point, I'm going to make her give her testimony of what, what happened. Because it's a very interesting story. I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version. Uh, one day, she watched a video where a woman had horrendous... Uh, medical problems. And I'll post her testimony in my Telegram channel. I'll try to do that tomorrow. She, this woman, had some of the most crazy medical conditions I've ever heard of. Uh, she actually had a near-death experience. She died. She her, left her body, was up floating in the operating room near the ceiling. And then uh, she was told, it's not your time. You have to go back into that wrecked, destroyed body. She's like, no, I don't want to. And she came back into her body. Uh, she was eventually healed. And Denise listened to this woman's testimony. And what happened was this woman was making all kinds of excuses for why she couldn't be healed. God is doing a great work in my life through all this pain and suffering. My character is being developed. And, and I'm getting so much fruit out of this. And there's a reason why God hasn't healed me yet. And she was just, you know, she had all these uh, thoughts as to why she couldn't be healed. Well, Denise is listening to this woman testify. And she's like, you know, that's pretty much kind of how I see myself. <laughs> Denise realized she had come into agreement with the idea that she couldn't be healed. Because I'd prayed for her. A lot of other people had prayed for her. And she just kind of accepted that God had a purpose for her not to be healed. When she heard this woman's testimony, she said, man, I have to renounce this agreement. I, I gotta, I like, I renounce it. Lord, I repent. I, I do not, there is no reason why I can't be healed. I believe you want me healed. I renounce these agreements. I break these vows. I'm not going to believe that anymore. And she then watched another video where um, a guy was, YouTube video, where a guy was praying for people to be healed. He said, uh, put your hand on your part of your body where you need healing. So Denise put her hand on her back and the guy said a prayer and Denise stood up and her back pain was gone. Completely healed. She was out scrubbing the pool, scrubbing the floors of the house, scrubbing the walls, cleaning everything. I mean, it was crazy. She just was like a cleaning freak for like <laughs> two or three days because she hadn't been able to do any cleaning for about six months. Um, she was so ecstatic, but it was because she had told herself she couldn't be healed. And as soon as she renounced that, boom, she got healed. Another tool, another thing to consider on the checklist, have you made agreements? Have you made vows? Have you come into uh, lies of the enemy that the enemy is using against you. And I'm going to segue into another tool, which is the court of heaven. Uh, I had a fever years ago, probably five years ago. Um, I don't get sick, hardly ever. I had this fever one day, and, and I was just, it was just a raging fever. I was, and we didn't know what was causing it. I didn't have respiratory symptoms. It wasn't a UTI. We don't know what it was. I just got this raging fever for like two days. And, you know, Denise is praying over me and I'm praying over me. We're having our friends pray over me and I'm not getting healed. It's just, I just keep on smoking this fever. I'm in bed and I'm just miserable. The third day 
I had the fever. I was laying in bed and I asked God, what's the issue? What's going on? What am I missing? What, what, am, I, what am I not picking up on? And in my mind, I saw a courtroom. And I was like, what, what does that mean? Courtroom. And uh, I, so I just kept my eyes closed and I saw this courtroom and it changed. The, the vision that I was seeing changed. I saw a book and I knew this book was accusations against me by some evil spirit. And it was the court of heaven. Uh, there was an evil spirit who went to the court of heaven and was accusing me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what do I do? You know, and I, and I remember, remember some of the things that Jesus said about when your adversary accuses you, agree with him quickly while you were on the way. Don't dispute your adversary. And I was like, okay, well, I agree. I'm going to agree with all those accusations against me and I'm going to let the blood of Jesus cover them. Basically, by, uh, by addressing that issue in, this, in the court of heaven through the, what I saw in this vision, um, the fever broke that night. I woke up in the morning, no fever. Everything was fine. I, I did a little more exploration, did a little more research. Have a little book called Defeating Your Adversary in the Court of Heaven. Thin, you can read it in 20 minutes. It's not, not real, uh, it's not rocket science. But sometimes evil spirits will accuse us and we have to go to the Court of Heaven and address the accusations. And basically your defense is always the blood of Jesus. Whatever the accusation is, you just agree with it. Yep, guilty. Uh, I plead the blood of Jesus, and normally that will take care of the issue. I have received many testimonies over the years of people that have been healed. They've had financial issues resolved. They've had uh, other issues resolved by, by going to the court of heaven. Another tool in the tool belt, and a big tool in the tool belt, is revelation from God. So I receive a lot of emails from people who just want me to give them the words they have to say so they can be healed. They want the magic words, they want the magic bullet, and they don't know what it is that's holding up their healing. Well, I don't work off of formulas. I work off of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the Son can do nothing of himself but only what he sees the Father doing. Okay, and. I can't get people healed very effectively if, unless I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. Ministry with the Holy Spirit, as Brian Fenimore says, is a dance. He leads, we follow. And we have to learn how to follow the Holy Spirit. One of the keys that God has given us with respect to healing and miracles is revelation. This is where the gifts of the Holy Spirit come in. This is where words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discerning of spirits come in. If you're not able, if you don't know, like I had some person, a person has pain in their back. Well, do they have an, a demon? Do they have an evil spirit? Well, I don't know. I don't, I've never seen demons before. I don't know how to tell. Well, guess what? If you develop your ability to see in the spirit, you'll see demons. <laughs> you'll also see angels. If you develop your ability to hear God's voice. The Holy Spirit will tell you there's a demon. Just get commanded to leave. Word of knowledge. The very first person I ever saw healed got healed because God gave me word of knowledge. He gave me word of knowledge. He showed me the woman and he showed me headaches. And I walked over to her and I said, you got headaches? She's like, yeah, how did you know? I'm like, because God's going to heal you. And I prayed over her and she got healed because God gave me a word of knowledge. Many times I've prayed for people to be healed of physical symptoms. And uh, the Holy Spirit showed me in a vision that they had emotional trauma. That was their issue. So rather than releasing power, I said, you know, let's try emotional healing. And we do emotional healing and they, and they get healed. I, I know a lot of you don't feel like you can hear God's voice. I know a lot of you feel like You'll never receive a word of knowledge. You can't see in the spirit. You can't see visions. You can't, I can't hear God's voice. That is BS. You can, okay? I'm an atheist, former atheist, <laughs> all right? I had never had a dream, never had a vision as an adult, never saw anything supernatural. I was as stone spiritually dead as anyone you've ever met. 
today, 12 years later, um, I, I hear God's voice pretty regularly. I see visions. And it's because I took the time to develop my ability to hear God's voice. We can all hear God's voice. God is talking to you. He's giving you revelation. It's a question of focusing your mind and learning to hear what he's saying. Focusing your mind and seeing the visual revelation that God's giving you. It's learning to see the demons. It takes time. It took me It took me a long time to learn to hear God's voice. It took me months before I started seeing visions. Okay, it's not something that happens overnight. But it is something that you can do. If I can do it, you can do it. Right? So, another tool in the tool belt is revelation. Word of knowledge. God will tell you specifically what you need to address. Case in point. One night... I was praying because Denise, she has gluten intolerance and she's got a bunch of other issues. And I had been praying for her to be healed for months. It wasn't happening. I said, Lord, what is the issue? What's going on? I don't understand. I'm, I'm frustrated. Please show me what the, what the key is. That night I had a dream. And in the dream, God basically showed me that the key to her healing is healing her DNA. She's been tested. Um, she's got some genetic mutations, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm working on that puzzle. I don't have the answer yet. Like, what, what is the what is the key? Okay, great. She needs her DNA healed. Hey, how do we heal the DNA? I don't know yet. Uh, uh, it comes a little bit at a time. Uh, I'm pursuing it. I'm trying different things. I haven't found a silver bullet yet, but... God did tell me that she needs her DNA healed. Because I love her and I want her healed, I'm going to pursue that. And at some point, we'll, we'll find the key to getting her DNA healed. All right, here's, here's another tool. Uh, one night I had a dream where I was in the ambulance transporting a severe trauma patient. This guy was crushed. He was in a car accident and like every bone in his body was broken. All right, I'm transporting him in the ambulance to it ER and during the transport I didn't do anything I arrive at the emergency department I take him inside I roll him in and the doc says what did you do on the way here I said nothing and the doc looks at him and goes well actually hang on a second the doc does an exam on him and goes well it looks like he doesn't have any injuries anymore what happened <laughs> right in the dream as I was sitting on the bench seat watching this guy, I knew that the presence of God was in the ambulance healing all this guy's injuries. God's manifest presence came into the ambulance and healed his injuries in a dream. All right, Brian Fenimore is a really good teacher. And he's probably the best day, current day teacher on God's presence. I've watched all of his videos on learning to hear the Holy Spirit and um, inviting God's presence into a local place. And I, I really didn't know what this is all about when I first started down that road. But Denise and I found out that you can invite God's presence, his manifest presence, his glory, into a room into an ambulance, into a car, and God's presence will do things to people. <laughs> and one of the things God's presence will do is heal them. Uh, when I was in Brisbane, Australia, years ago, uh, our friend invited us there to teach on healing. And we were out feeding the homeless, and this dude walks up to me, and I'm setting out a table, putting out coffee and tea, and this guy's standing next to me, and pretty soon he taps me on the shoulder and goes, hey, he goes, I got healed. And I was like, what? You got healed or what? He goes, I had a really bad toothache. And I was just standing next to you. And you, you got something on you that is healing. Because I got healed while I was standing next to you. <laughs> I was like, well, praise God. You got healed. Sometimes when we carry God's presence or his power or his glory. Some of us, we're glory carriers. We carry God's presence with us. Some, some of us are literally carrying the power of God. Okay, we can release that power. But there's also the manifest presence of God, which is God's glory. And God's glory, his presence, 
will heal people. In fact, Acts chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, multitudes gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All right. All. Not just the ones that God wanted healed. Not the ones that, you know, God wasn't working out some plan in their lives, developing their character. They were all healed. And this is Acts 5. These are just, you know, the disciples. But it's interesting that these people thought the shadow of Peter would heal people. Why would they think that? Why would they think, oh, if Peter passes by and his shadow hits that person, they're going to be healed? Because I think that uh, the disciples knew how to carry God's glory. They carried his presence. And the Holy Spirit was just waiting to get people healed. Uh, and and I've, I've seen this. Um, I went on a call one uh, years ago for a woman who had a two-hour nosebleed. She, she was bleeding like she was filling up a trash bin full of wadded-up tissues with blood. Blood clots, and you name it. And um, she had had a nosebleed for two hours hours when I arrived on scene. I got on scene. Uh, I took report from the lieutenant. I interviewed her briefly, got her history. What meds are you taking? What have you done? Oh, you had this happen uh, a year ago. She had to go to the ER. She got cauterized. She was afraid she was going to have to go to the ER this time, get cauterized again. And lo and behold, we're on scene for about two minutes and her nosebleed completely stops. Done. And she looks at me and goes, you know what? This is crazy, but as soon as you walked in the door, I think my nosebleed stopped. <laughs> and I was like, really? She goes, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And so the, the engine company that I was with, they're like, oh, it's the healing medic. Oh, just have him go on all of our calls and he'll heal people you know, the rest of the day. Well, they were making fun of, of this, but, but in fact, I suspect that her nosebleed got healed because... Um, the presence of God was was with me. Now, I, I had been doing some worship time on the way to work that morning. And I was asking God to bring his presence to follow me around that day. And I think he did. God's presence, his manifest presence, his glory will heal people. And the nice thing about that is it's really easy. You don't have to command anything. You don't have to release power. You just need to show up and have God's presence with you and it'll heal people. God is far more willing to heal us than we are willing to receive it. All right. So I'm going through these tools and I'm, I'm suggesting to you that there are reasons and things and tools and, and things that we need to just check and, and find out. You know, do we have a, a DNA issue? Is there some generational issue that's going on? There are many, many things that we can do to either hold up or bring healing. And a lot of people wonder, why is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult? Why can't it be easier? Is, is, does God want this to be difficult? Does he want to make it hard for us just because, you know, he wants to make it hard for us? I don't think so. God is primarily interested in relationships. Yeah, he wants us healed. But more than anything, he wants us to walk in a relationship with him. And when we, out of frustration, out of fear, out of whatever your motivation is, when we come to God and say, okay, I want to learn your ways. I want to learn about the supernatural. I want to learn about healing and miracles. I want to learn about deliverance. I want to learn how to live the way you want me to live. When we come to him and say, hey, teach me, he'll teach you. It's a process, but he will teach you. He is primarily interested in relationships. And I'm not going to say he makes it hard because he wants a relationship. I will say 
that it becomes a lot easier when you develop the relationship. Funny how that works. When you are willing to walk with God in a relationship, He will give you the keys to the kingdom. He'll give you the keys to healing. He'll show you what's wrong with people. He will show you what you need to do. He'll teach you. He'll train you. He'll equip you. He will make it easier for you. That's the benefit of walking in relationship with God. Everything becomes easier. And I mean everything. I mean, when I, I first got saved, my life fell apart <laughs> for seven years. I was harassed and tormented pretty hard. I was living the life of Job for about the first seven years after I got saved. But after I began operating the supernatural, hearing God's voice, seeing visions, seeing people healed, man, he, the, the blessings came in droves after that. When I started walking in relationship with the Holy Spirit, uh, in the first seven years I was saved, I had a really good relationship with the Bible. I knew the book inside and out, but I didn't know God's ways. I didn't know the Holy Spirit. 2008, God started giving me dreams and visions, and I kind of pressed in, learned to hear his voice, learned to see visions, took my dreams seriously, started journaling them, uh, asking for more revelation. That's when my life completely changed. Um, it changed in, in many ways for the better. Yeah, I've had attacks. I've had obstacles. But he warns me. <laughs> he warns me ahead of time. Hey, they're going to take down your YouTube channel. They're going to take down your Facebook page. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Watch out for this stuff. Plan for it. Prepare for it. it Having a relationship with God doesn't mean you're not going to be uh, face opposition, but it does give you a much better chance of knowing how to prepare for the opposition. And, and healing and releasing miracles is just a part of walking with God. Uh, anyone can do this stuff. If a former atheist can do it, you can do it. So here's your assignment. I've given you some ideas. I've given you some insights. And now it's going to be between you and the Holy Spirit to go out there and lay hands on people and get them healed. I'm going to continue posting testimonies in my Telegram channel. And, you know, I'd encourage you to just read the testimonies. Most of the testimonies that are coming out are people who are praying for themselves. There's some now that are praying for other people to be healed. <laughs> The dude who had the testimony two days ago of his mother goes into the OR when they found a mass, uh, which is probably a tumor. And he goes in there and they're doing the endoscopy and it's gone. It's missing in the surgeon's like, we don't know what happened. It's right there on the scan. You can see it. And now it's not there. I love those stories. Uh, I love the stories. There, there's nothing to me in, in life that's better than a great testimony to the amazing things that God is doing. He's doing a lot of amazing things right now. So I would just encourage you all to step out. Realize that if, if you're going to pursue healing and miracles, it's not going to come overnight. Uh, although you can develop quickly if you're persistent. And if you are able to believe that God wants people healed, that's the key. The key to releasing power, exercising authority, is believing that God wants those people healed, and when you lay hands on them, they're going to be healed. That's the key. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, that is the end of today's broadcast. I'll have the replay live stream. Uh, I'll post it up on Telegram this afternoon, and then put it up on Rumble and on the website uh, tonight or tomorrow, whenever I get time to do it. All right. Thank you very much again, everyone who's praying for us, uh, people who are supporting us financially. We love your support. We, we are so appreciative for everything you do for us. We couldn't do it without you. All right, keep us in prayer. Love you all. Take care. Catch you on the next broadcast.